And I'd very much like to introduce Ilona Haberstadt now, Ilona Haberstadt, should I say, a founding member of the Scratch Orchestra, a filmmaker, um, and the editor of Pix Publishing, um, or Pix Magazine, Pix Journal, um, uh, who is going to talk about and show a film um, about uh, various things, including the Scratch Orchestra. She's going to be joined um, uh, in her lecture or in her performance by Michael Parsons and Stefan Shalkan, who are both also founding members of the Scratch Orchestra, which is an enormous privilege to have here today. Angela has kindly agreed to be part of the performance because um, I can't explain, the best way I can explain what the Scratch Orchestra is, is by um, whatever it is that we're doing at the moment. Um, and to explain how, how it is that Michael is here and Stefan is here. Um, the Scratch Orchestra officially started in about 1969, I think, and finished in about 1972. But um, for me, uh, it's obvious that it still is the Scratch Orchestra, and that's what's so, so very fascinating about... Um, what is called the 60s, this, this, this thing which, was, uh, which happened and was in, uh, developed in the 60s is in fact still the Scratch Orchestra. So that when I was asked to talk about the Scratch Orchestra by Jason, I immediately agreed because of the nature of his uh, coordinating, rearranging and really curating, which actually makes um, makes history alive, because although I'm very interested in history, I'm quite suspicious of history being um, made too academic. Um, I don't want to be looking at the past in a so-called objective way, because in order to understand history, I find one needs to somehow have uh, to experience um, it is a process, obviously, not, not in an empirical sense, but to actually experience history as a process which constantly is going on, rather than something which needs to be made into an icon where it becomes dead. And this often happens nowadays because, I guess, of uh, capitalism or whatever, <laughs> commerce, objectifying things, making them sellable, making them acceptable. Um, Last, two years ago, Carol Chant, uh, indeed a founding mem member of the Scratch, because I wasn't a founding member, um, organized, I think it was a 48-hour uh, jamboree about the Scratch Orchestra, as an anniversary of some kind, and it went on for 48 hours on resonance radio. And I participated in that as well, and there, we talked, so nothing could be seen, it was all talk, and it was highly enjoyable because, again, there, were, uh, there, were audio, uh, there was participation, uh, dialogues, um, the whole thing was like a scratch orchestra in the e event. So that, going back to something, a sentence I didn't finish, as I, which I began, <laughs> when I started, when I wa was asked to do this talk, I sent an email to all Scratch Orchestra members, most of whom seem to be on holiday. Uh, but, I, but I did, but I talked to a number of people about doing this with me, and it was as easy as it would have been 50 years ago, or whenever the Scratch Orchestra, 40 years ago. Uh, I rang Michael, and immediately there was an understanding. We didn't have to discuss at great length what he would be doing, what I wanted him, I wanted him to participate. And the same happened with Stefan. Um, now, there's an interesting fact about, I found the Scratch Orchestra during, uh, I found some, some of the events in the Scratch Orchestra. Of course, when I was using eight millimeter film, each of which was three minutes long. So although I feel as if one feels one is, one has filmed years of activity. In fact, what one has filmed is, is three-minute bits of, 
<laughs> in between all the, all the actual concerts of the Scratch Orchestra. There was, um, filming the Scratch Orchestra in itself can tell one a lot about what the Scratch Orchestra was and about the period. Nobody seemed to want me to film the Scratch Orchestra. I like doing Super 8 films, so I, I filmed it. Um, funding. I went to Cornelius and said, I've run out of film, can I have a bit of film? He gave me a bit of money and said, oh God, and he gave me the money and I bought the film. Um, nobody was interested in recording what we were doing. It's almost the, it's the opposite of the experience of talking here today, because apparently we're being recorded, and that is quite normal nowadays, to record things. But part of the whole ethos of the Scratch Orchestra is that it was that we were living and playing to live audiences and that recording what we were doing was of no, no relevance really. Um, a few people sometimes helped me, including Steph on this, of having ideas about what I should film, but generally everybody ignored it. However, you will notice the contradictions because there's a point where uh, when Cornelius, where something is being filmed, and I suddenly realized when I was watching the film that Cornelius is running behind. So he was actually decided that he would participate in this film because it, it was yet another event. In other words, filming the Scratch Orchestra was actually sort of part of the event. Now, some of you may not know what the Scratch Orchestra is yet. <laughs> um, in In 1969, um, Cornelius had written The Great Learning, I think. I know very little about this, but and he wanted people to play in it. He was a musician and already a very well-known musician, composer. People uh, sort of came and played in this piece, which is now well-known. He then gave an experimental class, music class, in Morley College. And a lot of people came to it, and at that class, the idea of the Scratch Orchestra um, was devised, and Michael, was, uh, Michael and Howard Skempton uh, seemed to, have, uh, to be always credited to, together with Cornelius for being the founder members, but I think it's because they had five pence or something, they could contribute to the first fund, wasn't it? You had some, you, you contributed to a fund or something. There are various stories about it. There are various stories, yes. One story <laughs> is that we were the only ones who had five pounds in our pockets yes. at the time. That's, that's an apocryphal story. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's it was a certain amount of agreement about who would do the organising. Um, I am going to say something about funding. Um, like the recording of film, funding was something which I certainly never thought about. Most Scratch Orchestra people never thought about the funding. It happened. We weren't paid. Nobody wanted. Nobody was paid. It was a way of life participating in the Scratch Orchestra. But what had to be paid for was venues. So uh, money was raised, uh, but we gave very. Most of us gave very little thought to it. Uh, I'm told that Cornelius used to sit at home and do all this sort of um, writing down and administration calculations and um, raised some funds for playing. You know, we played for the BBC, we played for Queen Elizabeth Hall. When I say we, I don't mean me personally. Queen Elizabeth Hall, the personal room, etc. the Scratch Orchestra. And for that, we needed to have a few funds. And we went on journeys and the coach had to be paid for. Um, and this film is going to be about two journeys. Um, but I, I spoke a few days ago to Victor Shenfield. Victor Shenfield said that he raised... Cornelius asked him to raise... He was, does anybody know what the AMM is? Does anybody not know what the AMM is? Everybody. Okay. <laughs> The AMM is an is a improvisated group which is still playing and uh, started from two people who played experimental jazz but, but became a very, very 
an experimental group. It became an improvisatical group and it still exists with members changing. Um, Victor Shenfield said something. Apart from that, I'm really not trying to give you too many facts. There's a book by John Tilbury, which you can, a biography of Cornelius Cardi, which has a lot of, of the history in it. The point I'm trying to make is Victor said that when he went to the Arts Council and the BBC, the problem he had about the scratch orchestra, about raising money for the scratch orchestra, as opposed to the AMM, which was an improvisatory professional group, is that neither body understood. They, they, were, they were rather perplexed and worried to give, although they did give a little bit of money after a lot of argument, because the scratch orchestra could not be... One couldn't say what it was, and I still haven't said what it was. It's very difficult to say what it was. <laughs> and um, the Arts Council at the time really didn't like it, not not in the times I knew the Arts Council, when they would have known perfectly well. Um, they couldn't, they, they didn't understand what it was about. Uh, they said, is it professional? If it's professional, we can give it, give it money. If it's amateur, you know, okay. So, now, the Scratch Orchestra allowed anyone to join it. Once it was started, anyone could join the Scratch Orchestra. They didn't have to be musicians. We played music. And we had visual... Uh, part of the happenings were visual. So some of the members were artists, uh, painters, performers, and some were well-known professional musicians. But no distinction was made between uh, what you were, uh, the scratch orchestra could allow anyone to join it. They didn't have to know how to play an instrument. Okay, another thing I want you to watch in this film is... I think this is... Um, um, uh, I've put a lot of uh, facts there and I haven't got anywhere. So, <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to... Although I think it's building up. And I think it's time to see a little bit of this. Now, this film is simply part of footage which I shot. And the interesting thing about it is that it is completely silent. It's a film about the scratch orchestra, which is playing music. And the film is completely silent. Uh, it's silent because I didn't have the means. I didn't have an assistant. Somebody wanted to do sound. Other people were recording sound. They, uh, very bad sound, very bad quality sound. But as I said, nobody was interested in, in, uh, in uh, recording. So there's a special stuff about, uh, there's a film about sound, about sound and music and all that, and it's silent. But actually, that isn't a bad thing, because participating in, in, in this group kind of orchestra meant that silence was a very important element. Silence in the sense of um, listening. When you play with other people and um, you, you have to play with other people and um, there's a lot of listening goes on, and silence is as important as the music to actually produce what it is that has been produced, that we produced. Um, I think all the gaps which I'm leaving will have to be just filled up and asked me questions. I think we should now look at the film. At this extract, now this extract of the scratch orchestra, um, was made for the launch of John Kilby's book on Cornelius. So it's kind of edited in such a way that Cornelius said, Cornelius Cardio becomes an important, it's, it's edited around his participation. And that is uh, contradictory because the scratch orchestra aimed and had no elite, it had no organizer. Although some people took it upon themselves to organize, everyone was but this was equal. There wasn't a structure. There was not a hierarchical structure. So, 
editing it in that way was for a particular purpose. And when I put all the footage together, it won't be organized in that way. Because all the different interrelationships between people was important. But it works. And so here we have it, and the film is called Still Scratch. Still Scratch. The, the extract is called that. The footage I've got, if it ever uh, gets put together, is called Still Scratch. Orchestra. It's still happening. Okay. So we look at it. So we look at the film. Yeah. Ah, it's good. That's Cornelius Cardi putting up a poster in a village. This is a journey through a village, in a village. The journey was to Cornwall and then to Wales. And we played in villages to people who lived in the villages, to, to pass us by. There is Stefan Schilkun, who, is, who you're seeing here, who is here, and John Tilbury in front, carrying a pipe. Uh, through the village. And there is somebody else from the scratch orchestra who has found something to play on in the village. And so it's so uh, fuzzy. It's Here they're playing some sort of rock music, and there's Keith Rowe. <laughs> and that's part of our audience, Hell's Angels. There was a whole lot of Hell's Angels, and they sort of got quite interested at a certain point in what we were doing. This is not a concert. It's us walking through the village, announcing more or less that there will be a concert. <laughs> On the left is Cornelius card. You're playing the st a stone. Hi, Michael. You're on. Uh, this is your, to your voicemail, but uh, as you're playing, you probably don't want to be interrupted. So, I was wondering what you thought about Ilona's uh, explaining who everybody was and things like that. I don't know. What do you think about it? Idea, yes. Oh, you sound extremely real. Okay. I'll accept. 
attention to this because what is being described is something which Stefan Schulkun, uh, it's, an art, it's a work of some kind, visual work, which Sai is explaining there's Cornelius running behind in order to be in, this, in the film, in spite of pretending not to want to be in it. And um, there's a, I'm walking under this artwork which was, invent, was done by Stefan and Sai so helped him put it among two rocks. Is that right? You see, it's a disc. And they put it between two of these cliffs so that and we went and filmed it. Um, seems to have been cut short, but um, anyway, this is Michael Cardio, Cornelius' father, because we were camping in a field outside his pottery, he was a potter. There's a lot of family stuff. Family is just, we're there, you know. My mother was there and my daughter was there. And a lot of people's children. Is there too. This is an actual concert, that's why it's so dark, because I had no lights. <laughs> No doubt you've been at home. Piece called Sovani something. It was written by the first, this person as well. Because a lot of stuff by the Scratch Orchestra were composed pieces by its members. They would buy the piece and people would then perform them. 
And this is in North Wales. This is Greg Bright who's disappeared. Yes, he's disappeared. He, he, he made mazes after the search and understood. These are members of the audience. The audience would just come and join us and don't ever ask questions like this. Cardinal's hat is um, Eddie Prevost. He's stunning and a gay man. And this is Primrose Hill. A concert in Primrose Hill which was devised by Castle Williams. obvious by now that the Scratch Orchestra comprised of people who were professional, well-known musicians, painters, all sorts of people, people who could sigh and play the violin and, was, and, and sang like a bird at night waking everybody up. And Cornelius, who was a, where a composer already recognized, was playing a stone. That, that gives you an idea of what was happening. But there were, it was not all improvisation. In fact, Every concert or every event was uh, somebody's idea, and then they would uh, make a plan, and we would gather there and 
contribute. So things were planned, there were projects, there were projects on the time, projects. Um, there was spontaneity, there was improvisation, some people think it was improvisation, some think, people think it was all compositions. Uh, no, I haven't made my second point. Autonomy. The thing, as you probably gather as well, was not organized in, in an autocratic way. Uh, there were, it, was, it was run, uh, everybody ran it. But there was order, freedom within order. Um, the, um, the 60s, the 60s, and this is a long debate, but the 60s come from the 50s and probably go back and back or can't write history by just talking about the 60s. The 60s are a very complicated thing. But if you take Africa or the many, many you know, third world or something, Che Guevara, uh, Malcolm X, Ben Barker, all assassinated in the early 60s, enormously important uh, political um, things happening which changed the possibilities and destroyed some possibilities. When we talk about the 60s, we're talking about 68, but actually all this starts somewhere else. So when Cornelius is sitting with people, I have known Michael since 1957, 1957, eight, eight I'm told, is when CND was formed. We were both at Oxford. It involved us immediately, one was involved immediately in CND. CND became very important. The same year, the, 1957, I met a lot of musicians, Cornelius, including in Darkington, where they were well known experimental composers. Some of them studied with Bullis, some with Stockhausen, and Cornelius influenced by Cage, whom he'd met, who then, and we then formed the Contemporary Music Club in Oxford, where he invited John Cage and so on. So the whole idea, lots of ideas, like chants from John Cage, which actually isn't the same as improvisation, is the opposite. <laughs> so the whole lot of issues there, which actually can't even begin to really be developed here. Uh, jazz, we were all listening to. Dizzy Gillespie, uh, and uh, Charlie Parker. Jazz was enormously important for the development of ideas and uh, <coughs> music in this classical, to this classical musician. Cornelius was enormously influenced by jazz. The AMM, the improvisatory group, started as jazz people. So there's a whole lot of influences. The six, when, when the Scratch Orchestra was being formed, a lot of people, including myself, had already been in student education at the London School of Economics, other universities, where open universities were happening, where students were taking on, were occupying the university and taking on educating themselves. So all the 67, there was a roundhouse day, um, open university organized by uh, Lang and Cooper and so on. Stokely Carmichael talked there. Um, the ideas of actually non-autocratic organization, of democratic uh, self-autonomist, autonomia type organization was happening everywhere. And people came, nobody ever mentioned it. I discovered two years ago that people were doing that then. When we were in the Scratch Orchestra, we didn't talk those politics, but perhaps I ought to just finish by saying that the Scratch Orchestra is often presented as having a break. It had three years, and then people got interested in politics, and they became political. And I think that break is, doesn't really work, because the Scratch, the scratch Orchestra was active in a political setting um, from the very beginning. Lots of interesting issues about culture, nature, recording, filming, spontaneity, how you run things, how you relate to other people, how you live in communities was constantly being lived. There wasn't much discussion at the beginning about these things because what happened was we simply played, we, 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 we played, play, play. <laughs> we played in all its senses. And the play was on many levels very serious because it changed people's lives about what they thought was possible about how you related and worked with other people. And it's changed some people's lives forever, so they say. 
The thing is that there was a context. There's a context going back to the 50s. There's a context uh, in all the things which were happening. And the politics was not discussed, but it was there all the time. This was a political activity. And as I'm a political philosopher, neither a musician nor a painter, I've always thought that human beings don't just have a need, f uh, the, the, the need for food. It's obvious they don't just have the need for food. They have a need for creativity, for art. Art is not just something on top there which you can have as a luxury. It's clear that in the most extreme situations, art is very important to people. And um, somehow the scratch orchestra combined this activity which allowed um, and politics is the same. Politics isn't just something you get interested in. It's part of one's life. It affects one's life. And art, the scratch orchestra constantly was working on the relation between art and politics, although that was not discussed as such. The practice was constantly being, um, there was, the process was happening. <laughs> the practice was changing. Uh, different people brought different things on it. The collaboration was un unbelievable. People were very diverse. Not diverse in a, in a sense in which Rivington Place is diverse. Oh, uh, that fortunately very, uh, came to pass <laughs> slightly later with the Black Audio Film Collective and, and uh, some Sankofa and so on. That wasn't happening at that time. But it was diverse in terms of individuality. And not individuality in the sense that everybody does what they feel like, that people invented things always somehow in relation to other people. We were facilitated and enabled to do things because there were other people one sort of one trusted to pay attention to what one was doing and to participate. And it's still happening. Thank you.